everyone through one lecture series. I hope you are safe and well wherever you are in the world, because today we have an amazing guest that will be introduced by Julia in a minute. So Julia and I will be your moderators today. And first, I would like to briefly introduce you again to this year's theme. So as you may probably know, and hopefully took part to it, last year's series, Crisis Action, What's the Emergency? aimed to start a debate on the role that the built environment plays in responding to the social, economic, and political crisis that our society is currently facing. This year's theme, Death and Life of Architecture, is instead focusing on the reinterpretation of these challenges, creating a parallelism between the stages of life and architecture. It is not only about analyzing the challenges, but it is also about questioning the way we interpret and talk with them. In what way? To explain that, we have a little anecdote. So in an Aboriginal school in Australia, there was a painting on the floor symbolizing knowledge with a child walking and talking along with his grandpa. So to us, it was pretty clear. It is the grandpa passing on knowledge of what he experienced in life to the immature child. But that was actually a very Western way to see it. And for the Wajuk Aboriginal community, it was the opposite. The innocence of the child was the symbol of knowledge because the child was teaching and questioning what his grandpa always took for granted and right as a postulate of society. So our lecture series is trying to do the same, reversing the cycle of life, going from retirement to birth and then death to question what we usually take for granted and the way we tackle these challenges we are nowadays facing. Seven episodes, retirement, adulthood, young adult, teenage, childhood, birth and death, with the aim of switching our perspective from the experienced adult to the pristine child. Today, we're going to present our first episode, Teenage. The first three as seen the presence of Patrick Devlin from Polar Thomas Edward Studio and Hilary Vernon Smith for the episode about retirement that discussed how society is changing in regard to the concept of third age and retirement. For adulthood, Daria Milian Bernal opened the debate on the topic of reclaiming abandoned urban spaces by local population in Central America. The last event, two weeks ago, young adult, as seen the photographer Lorenzo Zandri, investigating and interpreting the close kinship between building images and building things. So I would like to leave you to Julia and our guest with the one question in mind. Why do we people act the way we do? Is it the best way to do things or just the one we are used to? Julia, you go. Thank you, Ado, for your wonderful introduction. So I have a couple of communications as always. Uh, first, I would like to remind you all that this lecture is being recorded and it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel where you can catch up with all of our past lectures. Um, secondly, I would like to kindly um, remind you to make sure that your microphones are off for the duration of the talk. And thirdly, uh, our guest speaker is happy to take questions at the end of the talk and we highly encourage you to um, ask a question yourself by turning on your microphone, but if you would like it, you can also write it down in the group chat or on the Padlet link, which is available to you on the group chat currently. So um, I would also like to remind you to make sure that you follow us on our social media accounts on Instagram and Facebook at A131Strat, where you can um, catch up with our incoming events. Uh, our next episode of the lecture series, Childhood, is scheduled in two weeks time, and we hope to see you there. So yeah, communications are over and without further ado, I can introduce to you Ice Cream Architecture, which is a multidisciplinary practice of graphic designers, environmental artists, architects, and illustrators based in Glasgow. And it places people at the heart of its work. As a studio, they believe that placemaking and design should not be reserved for the professional, but rather be inclusive for all members of society and particularly for the young citizens of the world. This is why they value community engagement and consultation as a fundamental design tool. And through research and events, they make sure that the communities they're designing for feel ownership of the projects. 
In 2009, in fact, they set out in an architecture van to meet with communities and understand their needs. And since then, they have applied what they learned to a variety of projects spanning cities and towns across the UK and Ireland. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sarah Frood from Ice Cream Architecture. Sarah, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good evening, as you said, I'm, I'm Sarah Frood and I'm, I'm one of the founding directors of Ice Cream Architecture. Um, and I'm going to kind of show you a couple of our projects, but also kind of talk about um, where we're at in thinking about engagement and co um, community participation in architecture and design. Um, I'll share my screen just now and we can get going. Um, so I guess what I want to ensure um, through this lecture is that this is the start of a conversation um, and it isn't about me telling you what my experiences are. Um, so it's a start of a conversation on how we can make the most of data technology and blend it with meaningful face-to-face -face interactions. Um, so I want to explore what a new process for future development of places could look like. Um, and for me, when we're talking about teenage, I think we're in an era of being able to use live and real-time information to understand what is needed in a place, but it's not currently happening. So for me, teenage is that we're in a, in a time when actually we have a lot of resources available at our fingertips to understand better what places are, but we're not quite using them yet. So we have the foundations, we've grown to a point where that information is available, but we're not quite using it to the best of our capacity yet. In 2014, we supported a project to engage citizens in understanding data that could allow decisions to be made. But even now in 2021, um, we've not seen much of that being implemented. But this is for many reasons, and most of it is to do with the systems in which we are tasked to engage people with. Um, so the... Um, so... The first project that I'm going to talk about is um, myland.scot. Now, this is a, a recent project um, that we did last year. It was just pre-pandemic. Um, pre um, and we were basically tasked with asking the young people across Scotland what it is that land use in Scotland should be for them. And now, for me, as a professional, um, the idea of talking about land use in Scotland was such a vast project, such a vast concept that we had to figure out a way to make this accessible. And this kind of chimes back to our, our thinking in terms of how we engage. We very much value that for somebody to engage effectively in a project, whether it be about land use or developing a community or looking at urban design, people have to be given the correct information to do that. So we. Um, made sure that we provided everybody that engaged with the project with different levels of, of information, statistics that they could then respond to. Um, and it meant that in a really short amount of time, um, roughly six weeks, we were, we were able to engage with thousands of young people across Scotland to ask them what they thought of land use um, and what they thought that Scotland's land should be used for. Um, so we used both online and face-to-face um, -face engagement to develop that um, and using kind of engaging tools we went to various different communities whether they be rural communities or city communities and um, to get a really clear picture of what land use in Scotland should be for for the young people of Scotland. Now we've seen big leaps forward um, in the remit to engage people during development with this now being a standard in, in most projects. However, um, that engagement happens when the information gathered is moving, moving forward much slower than it's about changing a system and not a process. And we're seeing, a, I guess we see a varying level of quality and support for people to participate in the development of their place. And we're yet to see how this information information, um, and engagement is really impacting the system. So 
what we see in our work is that although we are quite often tasked with engaging with communities, actually how we can use that information to make an impact is often not in place yet. So the systems, whether that be within a council or within a development project, the systems to actually use that information are not in place yet. So that's something that we're really working quite hard to, to change. We think that by placing um, information, not just in the hands of the few, but the population as a whole, we can start to understand how even small changes um, can change the attitude or the feeling or the reputation of the place. Um, and we think this moves beyond thinking that because something is well designed, it's the right solution. So we think that although you can provide a high quality design for something, it's not always the right solution. For instance, in some of our work, we'll be looking at really small scale interventions. So do some homemade planters being placed in a rural village have more of a positive impact than creating beautifully, beautifully paved streets? Or is the solution for community a redesigned community center? Or is it the operation of the space that needs to be, that needs to make the difference? Now, I guess it's not to say that these solutions are the wrong solutions, but we need to really understand what all of these solutions are in a bigger picture. So we'd need to understand within the place that we are where economic restrictions are getting tighter. Um, we need to have a better understanding of the community as a whole and not just um, physical interventions that we're making. So I think as designers and architects and planners, we need to understand the whole picture and not just be stuck within the silo of, of work that we that we um, undertake. Um, another project, I guess, where we started to engage people to understand more about what influence they could make on their place was the Musselburgh Public Art Project. Um, now we were asked to make a public art strategy but as soon as we started to go out and talk to people about public art in their place um, they started to question well why is that money being spent on public art what what difference is that going to make to our community what difference is it going to make to our lives um, and having thinking about that with the kind of I guess with a, a conscience, then we had to demonstrate that. We had to demonstrate what difference that could, could make in the community. So we spent quite a lot of time working with various different groups across, um, whether it be schools, um, children, older groups, for them to come up with the things that they thought would really, really impact um, how they experienced their town. And they, that all then came together in the pop, public art dabbling project, which allowed us to create a series of mini installations across the town, whether that be um, weaving a net um, or um, creating small signs that the children had made in, in the school. Um, and these are all just small um, interventions that happened over a really um, short period of time, but they were just to demonstrate that public art isn't just necessarily a, a statue in the town centre or it isn't just something which you kind of walk past and it doesn't impact your everyday life, that public art could be something which actually changed the way that you engaged with your place. So whether that be about how you engage with the river or how you engage with the town. Um, so we started to create these installations that happened um, across across the town um, from knots and crosses in the bus stop to um, putting magnetic let letters on all the bins and it was starting to kind of add in layers of play um, and experience um, into the town and what all of this information did and and this project is really in here as an example of how you can take something from engagement to testing something to actually bringing it to um, through to the, the final um, product. So what all of this testing did was allow us to refine the briefs, make sure that what we were tasking um, the artists that were going to actually do the final installations with was the right and appropriate thing for the town and that the town itself had actually taken an interest in it right from the start and built that ownership. So 
Um, so when it came to the point where the, the final art installations were, were being put in place, everyone was aware of, of where that process had come from and that they had been involved in that process throughout. Um, the, um, what part of our thinking um, in all of this is that whenever we're, we've been doing projects so far, we, we always feel like we're, we're part of the journey um, and, and that not, not always can we make a difference, as much of a difference as we think we should be making because the system itself doesn't allow for it. So our thinking at the moment is like, what if we could radically rethink how we create, make and influence the places places and how how those places evolve and change you know at, at the at the moment we're working in a system that relies on creating static strategies so a master plan or a strategy for a place um, and that's the heart of how developments are achieved and this system is based on the era where live data learning from information wasn't at our fingertips in the same way as it is at the moment so creating a static plan, something which is a PDF document that sits on a shelf isn't necessarily the, um, the way that we should be working anymore, but it's going to take a, a massive shift to move away from that. So our thinking is that we don't need to stick to this idea of a static plan anymore, and we should be looking more to create evolving and changing landscapes and evolving and changing approaches to doing things. So we now have the ability to know how our citizens are moving, what the air quality is like at any given moment, what percentage of the population is in work, homeless or in education. But the information isn't stored or the information is stored and used by a fraction of society. And we know that we tread a fine line between privacy and open data. And this is part of the conversation. And this is why we're still in the infancy of being able to use this information in a way that can effectively make change. But something that we, that we don't think should be a barrier to, to how we move forward. Um, the, the image that's on um, the screen at the moment is when we worked, we did a project in, in Inverclyde and we were tasked to, with developing a cultural staff strategy cultural strategy. Now again we're working within the realms of creating a strategy and again that's something which we are constantly fighting against is creating a strategy for something which we know as soon as we write it it'll be static and sit on a sit in a place where it isn't live it isn't current with the current situations or um, influences that are happen, happening in that place but the best we could do in that situation is make sure that that strategy was fully rooted in what the community were looking for, but also fully rooted in the current strategy as well. So although it wasn't necessarily part of our remit, what we did in Inverclyde is we picked apart as much of the policy, strategy, local development plans as we could, and we placed culture in each one of those. And started to build a picture of well if you're doing if if culture had been included in this plan this is the impact that it could have made so if you had included um public art or if you'd included um your uh, you know a cultural program in this this is the impact it could have made so we started to pull that apart and what that meant for Inverclyde is that the whole structure of how the council was um, sitting at the moment so within the council structure there was different departments which would look at health and well-being which would look at housing which would look at um, all the statutory things that you would expect but culture sat nowhere it sat in little pockets um, and now the structure that sits within Inverclyde is that culture actually has its own um, its own department and um, its own remit and, and naturally sits more as a backbone to support everything rather than being something which is loosely kind of woven between the, the different departments. And we think that that is purely and simply because we did pull apart all of that information that was there. And part of our thinking around this is that everybody should have the ability to do that, to access that information and be able to pull that information apart, whether it's you as a professional or, as it's, you, or it's you as a community member, looking at all of the information that is um, 
available should be as accessible to me as a community member as it is to me as a as a professional so i guess just as we would use modeling to design a building or an or an urban landscape we should be using model modeling to create live city models where everything from traffic management to the number of children children achieving in school is being mapped but not just mapped but used and as a community member i should be able to know what the needs and the opportunities are in, in my community so that i can act and make decisions that are informed but it's not to say that it's all possible now but it is to say that we are in an age where this where we have learned how to do these things but not always use these skills effectively um, and we have a whole um, I guess a whole life ahead of us to make multiple pathways to success using um, data information and face-to-face -face interactions more effectively going forward um, I guess at ice cream we see the benefits and the risks to relying on data can have on on any project but in moving forward cities and places need to consider the overall process of how development happens we ultimately believe that by being smart with data, we can free up time and space to develop our face-to-face -face connections. And if as a resident, you can fully understand your place, then you can make more informed choices about what's going to make the most positive impact on your community. Um, I guess what we think to, is needed to make this change is a generational shift. So we're knowing about your place is second nature. So my children say for instance should feel like knowing the information about their place is something which is absolutely at their fingertips and therefore be able to make more informed decisions about what happens in their place um, and this information shouldn't be closed or um, be held in a position where people can can't access it um, and we think within this modeling, we shouldn't be looking just at the, the big scale data. We should also be looking at the small things. So if a community group decides to raise money and create a new park, we should be understanding what influence that has and not just the influence on the physical space, but also, also the influence on the well-being of that community and their capacity to do things in the future. Are there, is that community better connected? Do the children have access to better play? Um, does that bring a sense of um, purpose um, in in people's um, lives as they as they start to do these projects? So we think all of this starts needs to be modelled and and referenced as we start to make decisions about going forward. Um, now, as I've been kind of I guess as I've been saying um, throughout every one of our projects um, we feel like we're only touching part of the problem we're only touching part of the system and um, some of them more so and some of them less so and um, so from everything every, everything that we do in our projects whether it be about uh, trap doing engagement on george square doing engagement um, on a, a project which is looking at water management everything has a varying degree of influence that the engagement can make. Um, and that's not always the, the problem of the project, but it's, it, it's also the problem of the system that although we are, um, although it, it's almost statutory now that engagement should happen on, on all projects, the way that, that that engagement is used is not, um, is not always consistent. Um, and we need to start to think about that system to make sure that things are changing and moving forward. Um, and I guess with our um, most current project, the, the slide that's up just now is Innovating Communities. Now, this is a, a really large scale project um, that works across six counties in, in Ireland. Um, and we'll be working with over 900 people to look at how they can become more um, develop further capacity to develop projects in their area. So, and this will tackle everything from um, climate change to traffic management to public realm. Um, but our role in this project is really to build the capacity in the community to be able to take these projects forward. So we'll be working across these six counties um, to train 
design these communities and design thinking um, and that will be over 40 hours of training for each participant um, and this is where we could start we we feel we can start to take our thinking behind engagement and how it needs to influence the process and influence the system to another level because we're going to be involved for such a long period of time and with such a large segment of the community um, where we think we can take everything that we've learned from probably you know the smaller scale projects or the projects which sit probably within silos and actually work across a community, across disciplines and across sectors to look at how engagement and participation and building community capacity can actually really change the, the systems that um, work around the communities. Um, so we'll be asking people to add their local challenge and then we'll be grouping them into cohorts where we will then work with them through that challenge so that they can get to the point where they've got deliverable deliver, deliverable plans um, for their area. So those include things like climate action um, and, and digital inclusion. Um, now, I guess with all this being said, we're, we are aware of the, the challenges um, that it presents, um, but we think that the change needs to start somewhere and we believe this happens by acknowledging and documenting the power that sits within the community, but also recognising the incremental effect of the small pieces that are that are often overlooked. Um, I guess what I want to present here today is a challenge that opens a conversation rather than asking you um, to kind of look at what we're doing and this is what I want to present here is more a challenge to think about well how can you and others work to make a change in in this system because I know that from in the last 10 years that although we've seen change we haven't seen um, a drastic change in the system of how engagement is 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 taught or is sitting um, within the structures of um, getting projects approved or, or passed through. So I guess to conclude, I, I just want to kind of more open up as a conversation about what it, how this sits within current thinking, you know, within you as, a, as, an, an, as an audience, as architecture students or as students of different disciplines, how public engagement and participation actually sits within your understanding of how you're going to develop your own work and your own professional practices. Um, so I guess that's a, a summary of where ice cream architecture and where our thinking is at the moment and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much Sarah and it was really interesting and you're doing so many things as a studio in very different fields. Um, we're now, if anyone has a question, don't worry, you can write it um, in the Padlet if you want to, or in the chat, or if you just want to speak, feel free, it's very quite informal, so don't worry. Maybe to break the ice, I want to ask you something, Sarah. Yeah. Um, do you think that, for example, architecture schools or designers in general are playing too much on the ego? and less on the needs of people right now? Or what's your suggestion for students? Um, I think we, every, I think there's always a, a scale. Um, I think everybody that, uh, you know, we work with or have worked with, there's always a scale of ego versus um, kind of engagement. And, and, there's, and there's a debate as well, you know, as um, professionals that have trained for a long time to get to the position they are then that there, there is a, a debate about the you know having to have a certain level of knowledge and skill to be able to appropriately deliver a project but there is I think there's always a, a place for engagement and that's that's why I guess I'm talking about the system rather than the the processes because the processes can change quite quickly you can change a process of how you do something quite quickly but the system of 
how that process is implemented is a is a harder as a harder thing to tackle but I, yeah I, I think that we do tread a fine line between ego and participation and engagement are you ever surprised by for example when you're working with communities you expect something and the reality maybe it's completely different do you have anything every time okay. every time every time um, and i think and i think that's part of why um it you can't just rely on your experience or your professional knowledge because going into a community you cannot assume that just because you've maybe looked at a community that's similar to this before or you've worked in a place which is similar that you can apply the same techniques because those techniques are not you, you can never do a one size fits all because every community will come up with something which you just did not expect I, you know I, and you know you do it yourself you know and, and I'm just as much of a, a fault of it as as anyone you know when you first pick up a brief for something you go oh, this is the type of community this is going to be or this is the type of thing that they're going to need and as soon as you go and have even your first conversation with that community that is broken down. And then I think that's something which we have to make sure is happening a lot more because as soon as you have that, those, just those few conversations, you start to question why you're approaching something in a certain way. And what, why um, an ice cream truck? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was about approachability. Um, so, we wanted to break down those professional barriers of thinking that speaking to an architect or having a conversation about architecture or design was for a certain sector of the community or a certain sector of society. So we felt that by being in an ice cream van, anybody would walk up to an ice cream van and buy an ice cream just the same way as they should buy, you should be able to interact with architecture or design. Absolutely. Thank you. And There's a few questions on the Padlet. Uh, I can read a few. First of all, one that is very fitting, I, I'd say. How has COVID-19 impacted your approach to community engagement? Um, it has, um, because we, we do and did still very much value that face-to-face -face interaction and, and being in spaces with people and giving people experiences. So a very much part of our um, process of engagement is about giving people, I guess, creative experiences during engagement. That engagement isn't just about asking people questions, but it's also about them taking something away, whether that's a skill, an experience, they've met someone new, um, they feel more connected to the community is really, really important. Um, it means that we are using a lot more digital tools. We're figuring out every day new ways to um, create different experiences that mean because we can't do things face to face. We can't be in a classroom or in a town hall or on the street with people at the moment. So we're having to develop new ways and models for doing it. But, it, but it's also, I guess, opened our eyes to new ways to doing things um, where, and this is where our kind of thinking about um, the use of, of data and face to face and how we can blend that to, allow for more meaningful and more time for face-to-face. -face. So at the moment we are developing kind of more digital engagement tools, but not for the process of eliminating face-to-face, -face, but to allow digital engagement to give us a, a broad overview of where things are. So that then when we're going to do face-to-face -face conversations, we're a lot more um, informed than we would have been if we're just going kind of cold into that situation. Well, here's hoping that COVID is going to be a thing of the past <laughs> <laughs> in a couple of months. Um, another question is, in your experience, what is the best way of engaging and informing the community on a certain issue? Is public art the only way? Uh, no, I think, um, I think just as I said uh, a second ago, I think the 
the main um, the main components of successful engagement are making sure that people have a valid experience and um, so that they don't feel like they're just giving away their time or their information so that they have a valid experience whether that is um, a creative experience or an emotional experience or a connective experience but also the on the back of that engagement that you have a uh, a recourse from that, that people don't just feel like they've given away their ideas, their thoughts, their emotions, and then they are left with nothing, no, um, no response to it. So part of our kind of approach to engagement is always that people can have that re-engagement with the situation, that they can get feedback on what's happening, that they can find information on where that information is being taken. So. I, I don't think that there is one process for doing engagement and we haven't ever defined that this is the one process, but there are factors which make engagement successful that should be kind of maintained, I guess. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think it's um, the main, uh, I don't know, the main challenge between like engaging with rural communities and with ur urban communities? What, like, um, I think they've both got very, they've both got similar challenges. Um, I find, well, we find that in, in urban communities, you can probably find a lot more apathy where people are probably a lot more distracted by a lot more things. So there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more, there's probably a lot more engagement projects happening. And um, whereas in a rural community, you probably have less happening. So there's, you, you have a higher voice or um, more visibility within the community, but probably within a rural community, you're still probably only kind of skimming the surface with, or you could, you can only be skimming the surface with the loudest voices in the room as well. Um, but then conversely, you can have exactly the same situation in an urban population that has a really tight knit community. So um, we find like, I guess places that maybe don't have as tight knit a community in in a urban setting are a lot harder to engage because people don't feel that sense of community. They don't feel that sense of ownership in their place. Um, and places where there's a lot more of a transient community are, are probably harder. So, um, I mean, one example is when we were working on the Socket Hall regeneration framework with Glasgow City Council. Um, we were working with Gar the Garnet Hill community and there is a very active um, residential population, but there is also a really large student population in Garnet Hill and trying to get the voices of both of those communities heard was quite, quite difficult because the student population probably didn't see the, um, the need for them to engage in this because they're not a long-term residents in the area. They're probably only going to be there for a year or a couple of years. Um, However, they were always going to be a population of students living in Garnet Hill. So it was something that we needed to, um, I guess, tackle so that we did hear the voices and it wasn't just the permanent residents of the area as well. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, I think I forgot it, shit. <laughs> so, um, from what you said, um, it, look, it seems that the projects that you guys implement is more about implementing into a community and then getting reactions from like children like the cone that you had with like the drawings and all was very interesting do you after every project that you do do you kind of go back and kind of survey the reactions of people around it and do you take back that information for future projects does does this like assist you in to having gained knowledge from i don't know probably disabled people or children or the elderly because everyone reacts to things differently yeah I mean it varies from project to project and I guess that's that's that it kind of ties into the whole um we need we need a system change because quite often our projects are maybe short term or only have a limited amount of resources so that going back and reviewing with the people that you've worked with isn't always there as a as a potential and doesn't always happen and um, but is absolutely something that i think should happen um, and not just for us to review our own processes we do we do that internally anyway review how successful certain processes were but 
also just to review how how successful and how how economic economically advantageous it is to engage with people in that way as well so we're still fighting the fight and the argument for why engagement and engagement in a, in a meaningful way is important so we're still working through all of that so we still need to build an evidence base of why this is something that should be happening and happening on a consistent basis and not just a consistent basis that it happens with every project but it happens consistently as well that the process of engagement is happening consistently with the same level of quality and with the same level of impact on the work that it's that it's trying to impact uh, that's very nice thank you if anyone else has other questions, just feel free to ask them. Otherwise, I'll keep reading the ones on the Padlet. Um, there's one here. What do you think about local traditions? What is the boundary between limiting future possibilities and respecting the heritage? What are your thoughts? Do you think it's important to challenge them? Um, it's a, th this is something that we come up against quite a lot in our work because we do quite often work within heritage projects um, and there is definitely a fine line to tread between um, respecting but also looking forward um, you know and, and quite often that's part of our work is you know perhaps working with a heritage society in an area for them to one be able to tell you the the strength and um, depths of the history and traditions of the area but then for us to work with them to kind of weave that into what the future could be and whether that's in a public art response or whether that's how we build those themes into a strategy for an area um, or how we make sure that that information translates down to next generation so I think there's always different ways of preserving the heritage and traditions of an area without having to be constrained by them. Um, there's, there, I guess it's just being kind of open to that process, but being respectful to the people that hold that information and in those traditions and make sure that you're not losing any information in that transition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let's see, maybe we have time for a couple more. Um, once you approach a community, is it hard to encourage them to participate in your projects? Sometimes it varies. It varies across all, all of our projects. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes communities are, um, we did a project on Byers Road in Glasgow and we had 400 people turn up to a public meeting where we had to close the doors and not let anybody else in and um, you know that, that sort of thing happens and completely shocks you and then you know and then sometimes you know you've put a lot of effort into creating a really engaging event and um, things that are that you would hope the community would really enjoy and want to participate in and and people don't attend I guess it, it comes back to that no one size fits all situation where um, if it doesn't succeed go go back and try again and, and think of a different way to approach it and I think that's why we want to challenge uh, the kind of system, system of engagement where sitting in a town hall with some drawings on a wall is, is not what we would consider effective engagement you know, and, it, and no community should be expected to be able to read an architectural drawing when, it taken, when it's taken the architect five or six years to kind of get to the point where they can draw that drawing, but the community is expected to understand it straight off. Yeah, they don't have the tools. Yeah. Um, another question in the chat here, what is the typical length of your project? Do you have long-standing relationship with the groups you work with? Do you think the time scale has an effect on the impact of your project? Uh, I think the time scale it really does. Um, if possible, we would love to be working with communities for a lot longer durations than than we do. But the the way that projects run, it just it just doesn't it doesn't happen the way that our our projects are funded um, it doesn't happen that's why I kind of put the last project up on, on the slides is because we do have a longer gen duration um, with this community and being able to work across six counties 
um, with such a large element of the population does feel like it's given us more of a chance to spend that longer longer duration. Um, some communities we have long-standing relationships with, some communities will come back to us again and again. So we've been working in Huntley in Aberdeenshire um, for the last couple of years where we were commissioned to do a certain project and then they came back to us and asked us to do a little bit more and to add different elements onto it. So that has been quite a kind of, I guess, fruitful relationship where um, we do get to see things come to fruition and then the kind of the next layer or the next level and that does and that is a really satisfying process to be involved in, but it doesn't it doesn't happen all the time. Okay, then um, let's see, unless anyone else has any last famous words, I think we can um, wrap it up. And first of all, I would like to thank everyone on behalf of the A121 uh, Society for coming today. I'm sure you enjoyed the lecture as much as I did. And I would obviously like to thank Sarah to, uh, because of this wonderful talk that you delivered today. Um, and I would like to thank the members of the society that made this pop pop possible, and in particular Fiona, Edo, and Elena. And I would like to remind you all to uh, keep up to date with our events and follow us on our social media where you will find all of our upcoming uh, lectures. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I would like to um, say goodbye to you and see you next time. Thank you, Sarah, for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye.